Welcome to the Hey Legal Quiz with me, Edith Forrest. The aim of this quiz is to provide some light-hearted entertainment during lockdown and beyond. I'll be asking 20 questions of leading Scottish legal figures, questions which give insight to their careers and their lives beyond the law. So let's begin. So I'm joined today by Ed Togowski, QC. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to take the quiz, Ed. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so without further ado, we will launch into the 22 questions. So the first one, uh, if you weren't a lawyer, what would you be? I really wanted to be a war photographer. No. I just thought, um, I left school during the time of the Vietnam War. I thought the photographs that came out of that in time uh, and life in particular in those days were pretty spectacular and pretty stunning. And I thought that was really what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And if I hadn't done law, I'd probably have done that in photography, but especially a war photographer. I thought Don McCullen, uh, you know, is a terrific artist and that's what I really wanted to do. So what kind of age did you begin to have those desires? Oh, I think just even when I was at school, about 16, 17, that sort of thing, I thought that would be a really interesting thing to do and an important thing to do as well, to record what was going on. But uh, luckily I didn't do it and I'm still alive. So uh, (laughs) what what then took you onto your legal track? Well... um, What happened was I left school and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, I was staying with people for the Edinburgh Festival in Edinburgh. And the people I was staying with introduced me to WS one evening who had got very drunk at the Traverse Theatre that night. And he offered me a job in his office. And I had no no idea about the law and um, absolutely no idea about anything, really. And there was a bit of a loose end. I was still thinking about this war photography business. And he offered me this job, and I went along and took the job. And that was it. Okay. And that, that was re- really it. I turned up. There were two apprentices in the, in the court department. The office, uh, Miller, Thompson, Roberts, and WS, they did quite high-end divorce and reparation work, and there were two apprentices. After the first week, um, an apprentice left to become the manager of the bar theatre in St Andrews, and after the second week, the next one left and um, became uh, a barrister down south, and that left me at the age of about, what, 19, running the whole court department with two secretaries. Instructing council, doing consultations, doing the whole thing. And I would even go up to the sheriff court and do the ordinary court and take decree with a gown over my shoulders, which I wasn't entitled to do. And (laughs) the court partner was just a a delightful man. I just Mm -hmm. let me do what I wanted to do for a year. Then after that, um, I had decided, the first week I was there, um, the partner said, take Edward up to... Parliament House and Shulman Parliament House. And I actually never knew that Parliament House existed. That was the extent of my legal intelligence in those Uh days. And I went up, we went in through the WS door at the bottom, and it was just fabulous. It was an October wet, October day. The fire was on, Parliament House was there. There were a whole lot of advocates walking up and down in blacks in those days. And I just thought that was the most fabulous place I've ever been in. And I still do. I think it was absolutely wonderful. Mm-hmm. And having done a year, um, I then went to Edinburgh University and did a full year on a course there, and that was it. Oh. Came back to do finish off in my old firm. Very good. Well, that's a very interesting story as to how you came to be at the bar. And yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, we'll move on to question two, which is, did you have a nickname at school? And if so, what was it and why were you given it? No, it was always Ed, just yeah. straightforward. I've had it all my life and that's the end of it. So uh, that's it. Fair enough. Uh, question three, were you, were you a swatty type at school? No, I didn't go through school. I sort of went underneath it. I <laughs> didn't do very well at all. Um, I think I didn't try, actually. I really didn't try. And I think the teachers were furious at that. And there was a sort of reaction at the time to them being furious and me being even more lazy. And um, 
as a bit of a rebel, I had a poster of Che Guevara up on my study wall. Every Saturday night, the housemaster would come round and tear it down. Every Sunday morning, I'd put it up and so on and so on. Until at the end, it just you couldn't see Che Guevara. It just big holes for the corners where the safety bins <laughs> were. And that was it. But so, although I, I must say, I look back and it's very fortunate that for some unknown reason, they made me a governor of the school. And I look back and I realised that uh, my school days were probably the most important of them. And it did teach me lots of things mm -hmm. um, about life. But academically, I, I, I wasn't a slog. No. So were you just not interested or did you have other interests that you were more keen to follow? I or? think I didn't realise how important it was. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was only... Only when I got to Miller Thompson and I saw it all clicked somehow that you know there was you know you had a place in life and you could do things. And when I went to university, I found it very difficult to learn and work at university. And Bert Kerrigan, who was my criminal law tutor, mm -hmm. told me when I got twenty three percent of my criminal law that uh, I had really no future unless I did some work. Um, Not right. <laughs> <laughs> For my first class exam, um, I decided then that I would just sit and work. I just mm -hmm. sat and worked my back end off. I really did, and um, and that was a again that was an important um, you know important part of my life. Just to realise you just have to sit. Nothing comes without really really hard work. Yeah, that, that was it. And at school, I think I was a bit too immature to know about it, and just a bit too too sort of. Smirky, I think it might be the word. You know, <laughs> too funny and just making jokes all the time, and uh, it just it, uh, it didn't work for me. But uh, afterwards, it certainly did. It certainly did. Are you managing now to combine both the humour and the the work? Well, there's a lot of humour in our work, yeah. I think. And uh, but you do have you do definitely have to do the work. You know, there's, there's no doubt. I appreciate people who are who have a sense of humour. There's no doubt. Mm, absolutely. It's certainly needed in our job, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we see some, um, you know, we deal with some pretty horrible people and we deal with some pretty horrible situations and um, cross-examining people who have been the victim of crimes um, uh, and complainers um, is quite a hard, hard thing to do. And I tend to quite like... Films, Home Alone 1, 2 and 3 just cheers me up, no end. I can't be bothered with American Beauty or anything like that. Anything serious is not me. You do need a bit of humour. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, question four, Ed, is what was your first job? Well, as I say, it was that uh, job in Miller, Thompson & Robinson. I'd never really done anything apart from that. And um, the mo as I say, the moment, that first moment stepping into Parliament House was just absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. And the people in those days, the Clarks of Court, Process Department, were really, really nice people. If you made a mistake, they would help you. And they, they, were, they were really kind, I think, to me, because most of the other people all had law degrees and experience. And I was just sort of roaming about the place like... Um, you know, like an idiot. And but they were they were very good. And what I really wanted to do at the end, uh, I didn't want to do crime. I wanted to do valuation for rating. Was right. what I really want. Was what I really aimed to do. Uh -huh. And um, uh, after I came out of university, um, I was. Uh, fortunate enough to have as devil masters uh, Lord Hope of Craighead and uh, Bob Henderson. Mm -hmm. Who, two very contrasting characters, but two extremely, obviously extremely good lawyers. And I was sort of, um, when I finished and called to the bar, I was waiting, trying to get into the civil side. And an Edinburgh solicitor offered me a jury trial, which I won. Right. Uh, he offered me another one, which I won. And then the work just came in, and mm -hmm. uh, that was it. So valuation for rating, I had to just take up a back seat to my career, such as it is. So, <laughs> so that was it. So that's how I ended up uh, the High Court being shouted yeah. at, you know, by judges. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number five is, how do you define success? Oh, um, well, I think true success is a majority not proven in a murder trial in the High Court. There's nothing... <laughs> 
nothing better than that. And uh, on the other hand, failure is uh, uh, a majority guilty in the High Court. So, uh, but that's how, you know, winning is success, I think. Okay. I think. All right. Question six, your favourite drink? Uh, no, that is uh, a dry martini with a twist of lemon. Right. Now, I don't always have it, but that is my favourite drink. But usually it's a pint of some sort, but if I have to, if I have to, then I have a dry martini with a twist of lemon. All right. Very James Bond, Ed. Very James Bond, yeah. <laughs> And question seven, what don't you like about your job? Uh, injudicious judges. Judges who just aren't judge, real judges. They just sort of think they know the whole thing and they think they've worked it all out. And um, they, they don't have that sort of slight streak of kindness that I think every judge should have. Mm. I won't name them, but they know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, question eight. Which uh, was your most memorable case to date? Well, uh, I suppose the good answer is the last one. So all your cases are memorable in a way, but uh, I think being involved in the Orkney Inquiry um, when the children were taken away from the four families mm. was easily the most important and um, challenging, I think, case that I've done. Um, I got a phone call from John Moyer, who's at the bar, who's, who was a, then a sister in Orkney, who said that um, these children had been taken away by the social work department in Orkney and there was a children's hearing and could have come up. And uh, he'd instruct me before in regard to another child or another family that was involved and could I come up. And I had to drive for the, for the panel hearings the next, I think it was the next day. So I had to drive up overnight to Wiki Airport. A friend of the family was, took me across in a tiny little private plane from Wiki Airport mm -hmm. uh, to Orkney. I did the hearings, and then, which lasted all day, um, all the hearings for all the children. And then I organised some sort of legal team in relation to each of the families, and then came back down the road and from Orkney over to um, uh, I think it was Scrabster we went to, was it Scrabster? Um, at Gills Bay we went to, I went on a little fishing boat. Um, <laughs> so I turned up at the quayside with my coat and my blacks and uh, my wig and gown and a suitcase and got on this fishing boat and chugged across the Pentland Firth and came back. <laughs> and then, then uh, we had all the hearings and eventually we had the Orkney Inquiry and that, I think the children were taken into care in February 91 and the inquiry, finally, Lord Clyde finally gave his decision in '92, which in uh, October 1992, which exonerated the parents. But that was easily the um, the most important for me case that I've ever done. It was just four families caught up in a just a nightmare of legal. Oh, I don't know what the, the word to describe it is. Just a maze of legal um, contradictions and everywhere they turned, they couldn't get proper mm. justice for themselves. And really, we are very lucky because we're all trained as lawyers. And we're all trained in what the law is and how to apply it and so on. And most people have no idea. When they really come up against injustice, as, as these families certainly did, uh, it's our job to sort it out. And that's really a great responsibility. And I think it's a responsibility we all have, even in, the, in courts defending people. That's our job, and we've, we've really got to apply it. Um, but that, it was very satisfying because at the end of the day, they were exonerated. Mm -hmm. you know, so that, yeah. uh, so, and it's only so that, then, that, really, you maybe look back and realise just the burden that you've carried for these people, you know, and... Your legal, your yeah. professional burden. Not obviously. You, you can. It's sometimes you can get involved in cases, but as you say, you you are playing a very important part in people's lives, where they are relying on you to guide them through the maze of legal difficulties. Really, absolutely. And as as advocates, we do it 
in a far more serious way, if I say, say this, than solicitors who are entitled to walk away from cases if they mm-hmm. want to. But we've, you know, you've, you've really got to work hard for people who maybe um, aren't um, as well qualified as you to work your way through it. Um, and I, I, I think that's really what our job is about. I mean, we're pretty lucky to be where we are and what we're doing. Yeah. And um, we've really got to represent these people. But certainly the ordinary crowd was a fabulous experience. Yeah. It's in your mind, obviously. Uh, yeah. It stands out yeah. in your mind. All right. Question number nine. Tell me one thing that would surprise me about you. Well, um, one boxing day about six years ago, I sat down and I started to write a book. Okay. So I started to write it and I got really carried away with it because I thought it was really very good. Being the sub person I am, I thought, well, this is really terrific. <laughs> so I wrote it and by April I'd finished it. Right. And I put it all out at home and it was all laid out in the carpet. And I think I had six copies of it and I sent it off to six agents. Mm-hmm. Two agents wrote back and said it was complete rubbish. <laughs> Four agents wrote back, you know, which I sort of expected. Four agents um, wrote back and said they really liked it, but I couldn't write. Okay. In, in other words, I didn't quite know that I hadn't got the craftsmanship of writing. And one agent in particular was extremely kind and suggested that if I learned to write, then she'd look at things again. So uh-huh. I went away and I did two creative writing courses, one University of East Anglia um, for short stories and novel. I did a poetry course at the University of Oxford, um, all online courses, which were really excellent. And um, the poetry course was just impossible. Um, and I did a final novel course at the University of Oxford um, as well. And as a result of that, and I write, the stuff I've written has all been under a pseudonym or a nom de plume, and uh, so nobody knows who I am. Uh-huh. But as a result of that, I have one short story shortlisted in, for the Fish Short Story Prize, and one short story shortlisted for the H.E. Bates Short Story Prize, um, I had poetry published. I've, um, I've appeared at the Edinburgh Festival reading my poetry and short stories under the under the nom de plume. So I scuttle away at the end, so nobody spots me. And uh, and that's what I do. So the the book is almost finished. Almost, I just have to shut myself away during this time and just get it done. And yeah. and that's it. And I really enjoy doing it. It's um, it's really quite good. But it was, it was a lesson because if you expected somebody, I don't know who, any author to turn up in the high court and do a high court trial couldn't do it. Mm. So people who think they can write just have no idea. It's, a, it's really difficult. It's a real craft. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty poor at it. But um, and the writers that do write spend as much as their time as we do in law, yeah. they spend that time in writing. So it's not an easy job. But that's one thing I do that... Uh, I really do enjoy it. And all the little bits that I've noticed over the years goes into, into my writing. So. Mm-hmm. And, and in it. terms of the book itself, is it still very much based on your original story? It's just the, the writing itself? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, ab- absolutely. The story, the ending was a bit sort of silly. So that went out and I've rewritten the ending and I've... Uh, I've, I'm slowly getting it organised, and um, it, but it's still the same story, and it's still mm-hmm. the same character, and it's still the same people all round about. So that's it. Some of them based on people that I've met as well, right. and work with. If anybody's watching this, and work with. Fantastic. <laughs> and so, are you are you kind of guaranteed to have that published? Is that what they they've said? No, 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 no. Not guaranteed, but um, I'll, I'll I'll just keep going. I think until something happens, you know. But as I say, the the short stories are good. I quite like the short stories, and, uh, yeah, so that's well, it. I did not know that, Ed. So you're right. That's a prize. There you, are. <laughs> there you go. Um, question ten: What traits in others irritate you the most? Oh, I think uh, just prejudice. Really, I think it's a silly silly thing to have. I mean, people are just people. doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, what their background is. 
Um, and just to label people with a label and, you know, not look at the person underneath is mm -hmm. just really annoying. It really annoys me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, your favourite flavour of crisps? Um, salt and vinegar. Good choice. Yep. Confident answer. Um, question yep. 12. Uh, what book other than your own would you re recommend, or maybe it is your own, would you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only you'd ask me this, maybe if you're asking this in six months' time. <laughs> then, no, 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 no. Um, there are two, I think, that I'd recommend. The first one is, um, I think it's What They Don't Teach at Harvard Business School by McCormick, who, um, and that's a very good professional book. Mm -hmm. and uh, I had a mini devil last year and I gave it to her as a book to read mm -hmm. it's got all sorts of just small tips about how to live your life and and professionally and what to do and you know and, and rules and there's that and as far as literature is concerned it has to be Lolita okay and that's the annotated because <laughs> if, if you read the if you read one without the annotations, it's just it's just impossible. That it ends up in the bin. But the annotations are really good. If you read it, it's a it's a fantastic book. It really is, and it's every line has a meaning, and it's it's really well well read. So I recommend that to somebody. Very good. Okay. Question thirteen: Do you have any irrational fears? No, I have rational fears, mm -hmm. and the rational fear is um, rides uh, on um, uh, uh, things like Alton Towers, you know, these things that go up and down at yeah. speed, you know, sort of fairground rides. I just know when I get on that somewhere there's a boat that has worked itself loose <laughs> <laughs> and it's been shiggling about for, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks and when my carriage goes over it's going to come pinging out and I'm going to fly into the crowd and that's going to be it. And you cannot get me on those for love or money. I just think it's madness. Why ever you want to go on one of these? I just cannot do that. Can't I share your, I share that rational fear. It's crazy. Why would you want to throw your body about like that? Oh, it's a complete madness. It's like going to watch horror films. Why would you want to go and watch horror films? You know, it's just, but, but why would you want to go when you know that it's all been... You know, the, the bolts have been fixed by some sallow youth with a hangover or something, you know, and you're going to come flying off. So just don't, don't go, don't go on it. Don't Absolutely. On it. When's the last time you got on one of those things? Oh, um, just never, I think. I, I avoid it. I just stand at the side. I just let, um, I let everybody else go if they want to kill themselves. Fair enough. Yeah. And, and yet they're relentless in their persistence that you should get on it because they're getting on oh, it. Oh, oh. Absolutely terrible. And the other thing that I did was we were in Australia and we went on a ghost train, absolute ghost train. And they, they were, it was horrible. It was a sort of entertaining evening for everybody else. And you had dinner and everything. You went in this, it was a sort of Frankenstein night or something. You went in this ghost train and they photographed people in the ghost train, you know. And there are some people that come at the bit, they are always just at the same bit, they took a photograph. And some people are just not bothered, you know, just you know, like this. You know, I am just a welter of fear and, you know, when is it going to stop? And, oh, please, where is my mother? Take me off of this, you know, the whole bit. I was just pathetic. It really is. I can't do that. I cannot do these things. No. And as you say, other people are just fine. Other uh -huh. people are just fine. Yeah. Oh my goodness. No, I share that as well. I, you wouldn't get me on one of those things for oh, a lot of money. Quite right. No. Um, question 14. How old are your oldest pair of shoes? Now, the oldest pair of shoes I had lasted about 23 years, which were a pair of churches mm -hmm. that I bought in Jenner's nice. with my middle son, who is a bit of a style guru, and he recommended a pair of brown churches brogues okay. on the basis that you can wear them with anything. He said you can wear them with jeans, you can wear them with chinos, you can wear them with cords. So I've had them and uh, got them repaired by them. They cost an absolute fortune, and uh, but they lasted that time. I've now got a replacement pair of Crockett and Jones that I bought in London, 
they again are just unbelievably, you know, hopeless. But they'll last 30 years. So you get what you pay for, you know, Absolutely. it's like anything. You know. I think today, Ed, you have had the oldest pair of shoes of anyone that's answered that question. Oh, yeah, yeah, well yeah, yeah. If I'd, if I'd <laughs> known, I would have held them up to the camera as well. You know. But they, 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 you know, if you look after them, a, a good pair of brogues, brown brogues can go wrong. Absolutely. So. That's it. That's what, what is it they say? Buy cheap, buy twice. So you've got to put out the... Oh, the, the, absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. And, um, <laughs> You know, for every pair of sh black Oxford shoes from Clark's or something that you've thrown out, these brogues just sit in the cupboard looking at you saying, uh, I told you. You know, <laughs> it's thing. you know, they're looking at me every time I throw the other ones out. Absolutely. All right, question 15. Who um, has had the biggest influence on your career in the law? Well, I think um, it's a combination of that. Uh, chap who gave me my first job and let, and let me keep my first job as yeah. well, which is even better. Uh, David Noble, WS in Edinburgh. And again, it's your devil masters, I think. Um, I, as I say, I had two, I had Lord Hope of Craighead and I had Robert Henderson, QC, who were um, just remarkable and are remarkable lawyers. They really are. For all, for different reasons. Robert Bob was the best orator that anybody has ever seen in the courts. He was just absolutely terrific. And um, David Hope has the sort of mind that uh, I can only dream of, really. And um, they just taught me preparation, which mm -hmm. is the main thing, proper preparation. And I think from uh, David, I got the idea that if you're faced with a problem, you go right back to the fundamentals of law. You don't just look at a textbook and take what somebody said in a textbook. You go right back to look at the original, even institutional writers yeah. and find out what law's about and really work at it. Mm -hmm. And David Noble gave me the best bit of advice, which was, in law, don't cross your bridges until you come to them. Okay. Don't do, don't do too much. Don't look ahead and say, right, if they do this, we'll have to do that. Just take it as it comes. Yeah. That's it. That's good advice, given how things can change, especially in trials. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. All right, question 16. Your favourite chocolate bar? Twix. Okay. Again, confident answer there. No other <laughs> contenders? <laughs> well, no, you know what you're no, you know what you're getting inside that golden, <laughs> inside the golden wrapper. You know, you know exactly what you're getting. But it takes normal size, not the huge size they tried to be by in the uh, petrol <laughs> station. A normal size. Okay. Huge. Question 17. What is the fanciest event you've ever been to? Oh, um, I think um, it has to be the Blind Asylum Ball when I was a junior along with some other juniors. We had been at a bar dinner in George Street mm -hmm. and we were walking past the assembly rooms in George Street and we looked in and there was the Blind Asylum Ball with everybody going in. Of course, we were in black tie because we'd been at bar dinner. Right. Everyone's in black tie going to the ball. So um, I was there with other juniors who now are three senators, and then there were two future deans of faculty. And one of the group was Mike Jones. Mm -hmm. And we're looking in, and he said, listen, I'll tell you what to do. I'll go in, and then you come in in five minutes' time. So mm -hmm. he went down the side entrance and went in through a fire door. And we then, we stood our five minutes and came in. Mm -hmm. And they had two um, sort of guards <laughs> dressed in sort of... Uh, uh, dress uniform. There are two uh, soldiers in dress uniform for the blind asylum. And they uh, said, can we have your tickets, please? And I'm sort of going, well, uh, um, and down the stairs comes Michael Scott Jones saying, there you are, there you are, where have you been? I've been upstairs and got the table, got the table. Come on, come on. <laughs> The chat, the chat said to him, but they don't have tickets. Oh, don't be silly. They've been in already. He said they've given their tickets. Come on, come on. I've got the drinks. In. So that was it. And we went up. And what an embarrassment. We spent the whole evening just clattering about having been at a bar dinner 
clattery about this behind this island ball. And of course, yeah, it was a buffy meal. We had to sort of wait till people got up to dance and left the table. And then we'd go with our food and eat the table and all the way around. But it was very, it was very, very, very good fun. And as I say, there were a number of people who did that who should really have known better. But yeah. uh, that, that, I think, was the best. That was very, <laughs> very good. It was very good fun. Oh, an extra evening added on to a bar dinner, which was just terrific. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, question 18. What quirks do you have? Quirks? Well, I tend, now especially up in this um, house at the moment, I tend to roam about during lockdown muttering at things I hear on the radio. Right. Um, and I tend to sit and mutter and shout out loud at Channel 4 News in the evening. It's just <laughs> kind of um, So I'm all muttery and grumbling and everything. So much so that my son, my youngest son, who's uh, with us up here, has taken to writing them down. Oh He's got a list of dad's sayings, which are just <laughs> awful. And, uh, you know, it's just hopeless. So I think that's the quirk I've got. I, don't, I tend not to do it. I, it's, I think it's just come on up, up here, you know, so. You're, so you're going to have it. to give us an example, Ed, now that you've said it. Oh, um, uh, let me think. Oh, they had a, there's a thing on TV about um, some cookery programme and they'd made a pie tart <laughs> <laughs> with shortcast pastry and a pie apple and, and, pie and, and, and pears, pears it was. And they put this tarty thing in the oven and it, and it was some French man doing it. It was an enormous tart, an enormous thing. Huge, and he's putting it in the oven. And Alexander has recorded that. I said to my, to my wife, "You can make one of these. It doesn't have to be a bloody forty foot one like the bloody French." <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that gives you a rough idea of what life's like up here. You know, so that's been written down. You know, I just that spot what you do to show off like the French. So that's it. <laughs> Very good. Okay, question nineteen. Oh, I think you've, you've already answered this. The question 19 is, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? But you've probably already answered that. Oh, um, there's that. The other one that's, uh, that's a good piece of advice and is in that uh, McCormick book as well is, in a crisis, do nothing. Yeah. Often, you, you, you may be doing a court case, or even in your personal life, you might have a crisis. And you'll find that if you, if you do nothing, It'll sort, you know, it can sort of work its way out and the way out of the crisis that you didn't see on a Monday, you might be able to see on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Mm. And you can be too quick. People can be too quick. And certainly I'm guilty of it. Um, you can be too quick and too sharp. Um, but if you just do nothing, yeah. just let it ride out and have a think about it and the answer will come. So that's it. Yeah. Good advice. Sometimes doing, you just... Uh, have a knee-jerk reaction and you make things 10 times worse. So that is good advice. Just indeed, so indeed, indeed. And then you're digging yourself out of an even bigger hole. But just, <laughs> just let it, let it pass. Okay, dog. Um, question 20, what job would you be terrible at? Oh, I think any job whatsoever apart from the one I'm doing. And that's not to say I'm good at what I'm doing, <laughs> but it's just, I think, anything else. I... I um, uh, the war photography business would have been a disaster. I would have been shocked getting off the plane. Um, <laughs> I said to my father once, my father was in the army, and he, I said to him, you know, I'd quite like to join the army. He just exploded and said, you'd hate, you'd hate it. He said, all the time in the army, you're told what to do by idiots who are above you, and no matter how far up you get, you know, it's the same thing. So, and he was right about that, and I have got a sort of independent line of thought and I think the bar and advocacy is just just perfect just mm -hmm. fits what I want to do fantastic wouldn't do, wouldn't do anything else okay question 21 what is the weirdest talent you have I can make and I have been making it during lockdown the most impressive cauliflower cheese that anybody's ever had and just I've got that down to fine art well how often would you have that? The, 
of a week? Well, um, there was a grumble. There was a grumble for my son that they were getting it twice a week. So I think <laughs> because uh, no, but uh, I think about once a week we get mm-hmm. cold sheets, and I can do that. I've got sauce down. Just it's taken me years and years and years <laughs> and years to perfect it. But thankfully, because of the virus, I've, done, I've managed to do that. You know, so that's it. Good stuff. And finally, uh, question 22, Ed, what have you enjoyed most about lockdown? Well, um, I think really the, the, the trouble with lockdown is that I think some people, and I was a wee pretty guilty of it at the beginning, is looking on it as a sort of long university vacation where you can just swap about, do you want, read your books and all that sort of thing. But it's a pretty serious matter when I don't know how many thousand people have died in Britain, and certainly must be of three or four thousand in Scotland. And a lot of people have lost relatives and friends, and um, a lot of people will know people that have lost relatives and friends. So I don't think there's much you can like about it, you, can, you know what I mean? And I think it's a serious, it's going to have serious effects on people for a long time, I think. People's mental health will be affected. Their physical health will be affected by not getting treatment. Children will have trouble because they've not been at school. So, you know, I find it difficult to say I'd like, you know, there's anything to like about it. Um, The most enjoyable bit was um, going up to the moor um, and cutting peat one day with my son. And we went up there, we've got rights to cut peat and dry nets, you know rights to dry nets at the uh, harbour down the road. So if you've got wet nets, I'm about to come to, I can get your, wet, your nets dried for you. <laughs> but we went up and we had, we had a time up there just coming peat and there were skylarks and there were geese coming in to, to the, the lock and down below. And that was really nice. You looked out over all the old peat banks that had, mm-hmm. you know, people had cut over, oh, must be centuries up here, some of them hundreds of years old and that was a really really nice time but mm-hmm. as far as liking anything and enjoying I, I think um, you know life's going to be a lot different when we come out and we're going to have to adapt to it so yeah. um, so that's the that's the best thing I think all right so that's it okay well Ed you have completed successfully completed the quiz excellent well done excellent. and really interesting uh, answers there and I've learned a lot about you that I didn't know before so thank you very much right. for your time uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. so right. before I let you go can I just ask you to nominate somebody else to take the quiz well I think an interesting person would be Claire Mitchell all right we will check with Claire if she's prepared to do that so thank you very much all for right thank you for your time and uh, hope to see you very soon, Ed. Right, and you. Okay, right, bye. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Hey Legal Quiz. Quiz. We are releasing more episodes weekly, so please sign up for free to Hey Legal on our website to access our free content, legal updates, and more. Plus, follow us on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and on all podcasting platforms.